Kansas City Monarchs were founded in 1920, the same year as the National Negro League. The Monarchs were started by J.L. Wilkinson, a white businessman. Wilkinson was a former baseball player himself, but stopped after becoming injured. Wilkinson grew up in Iowa, and the first baseball team he managed was actually a traveling all-women's team that he founded in 1909. Wilkinson selected some of the players on the Monarchs from the All-Nations team that he founded in Iowa in 1912. That team played games across the Midwest until World War I, when many of the players were drafted. In 1912, they won 92 of the 114 games that they played. The All-Nations team featured Black, White, Asian, and Native American players. The team was known as a barnstorming team as they played exhibition matches in small rural towns and toured around. More players on the Monarchs were drawn from the 25th Inf Infantry Wreckers, an all-black military baseball team based out of Hawaii. In 1923, Jose Mendez, a Cuban baseball player, was hired to manage the Monarchs. The Negro League founder, Rube Foster, only used white umpires in 1920 and 1921 after the league's founding. The Kansas City Monarchs were the first Negro League team to hire black umpires and had six black umpires by 1923. A history of the Negro League World Series would be incomplete without mentioning the four-time champion Kansas City Monarchs. The Negro League World Series was a postseason baseball tournament that was held from 1924 to 1927 returning almost a decade and a half later between 1942 and 1948. Wishing to hold a postseason tournament akin to the White League's World Series, the Negro World Series would match the Midwestern winners of the Negro National League, NNL, and the East Coast winners of the Eastern Colored League, ECL. The first World Series games to be held by these two leagues took place in the fall of 1924 in Philadelphia, when the, when the NNL's powerhouse team, the Kansas City Monarchs, played the ECL's Hilldale Club. The Kansas City Monarchs would defeat the Hilldale Club in the series 5-4-1, to to taking home the first championship in the Chicago ballpark. Although the Monarchs would lose to the Hilldale Club the next year 5-1, to many consider the Monarchs to be the Yankees of the Negro Leagues, considering that they have won 11 league championships in total. With the ECL folding in 1928, many of these teams returned to independent play, all before the Negro American League, NAL, would be founded, bringing the Negro World Series out of a 15-year hiatus. After a second Negro National League would organize in 1933 and the founding of the Negro American League on the West Coast in 1937, the two leagues would agree to resume holding a championship series between the two leagues. In 1942, the Negro World Series would be back in action, this time pitting the Kansas City Monarchs against another legendary team, the Homestead Grays. This appearance would make the Monarchs the only Negro League team to appear in both the early Colored World Series and the later Negro World Series. The 1942 Negro World Series would feature seven members of the Baseball Hall of Fame, with Satchel Paige, Hilton Smith, and Willard Brown representing the Monarchs, and Josh Gibson, Judd Wilson, Ray Brown, and Buck Leonard standing in for the Grays. It is recorded that Satchel Paige pitched in all four official games, earning one victory and one save. While he was scheduled to start Game 4, Paige was nowhere to be found by game time. After the Monarch's starting pitcher had given up five unearned runs in three and two-third innings, Paige showed up to the ballpark, saying that he had been detained by police for receiving a speeding ticket in Lancaster, PA. Paige immediately relieved Joe Matchett, not allowing a hit or run in the next five and a third innings he pitched. Game three also came with its own drama, when the Monarchs claimed that the Grays were using ringers. This was likely because the Grays had a scramble for players after getting hit with a few injuries and other reasons for ballplayers not being able to make it. While the Monarchs objected to this cheating, they played the game under official protest, as all their fans had already showed up. Monarch secretary and business manager William Dizzy Dismooks stated, quote, We didn't play the Homestead Grays. We lost to the National League All-Stars. End quote. The Monarchs were extremely successful towards the end of the 1930s. They became charter members of the Negro American League in 1937 and won the first league championship that season. 
That kicked off a run of championships in six consecutive years from 1937 to 1942. But they didn't just win a lot of games. They made a cultural impact, and they were innovative. They were the first professional baseball team to use a portable lighting system in order to play night games, years before any major league team had the idea. During the Monarch stretch of dominance in the late 30s and early 40s, some of their best and most iconic players debuted, including Jackie Robinson and Satchel Paige. When Paige was signed, many in the game thought his best days were behind him and that he was done as an effective starter. Right-handed ace Satchel Paige, who had barnstormed with the team in 1935, rejoined the Monarchs in 1940 after rehabbing a torn rotator cuff on their B team. Page had lost his fastball and was widely presumed to be past his prime. As the story goes, Page arrived at practice one afternoon during the summer of 1939 and told his catcher, Slow Robinson, you better be ready because I'm ready today. Robinson said Page then threw the fastball at him so fast, knocked the mitt clean off his hand. Page was a legendary figure in baseball, and the mythical stories surrounding him only grew during his seven-year tenure with the Monarchs. Standing more than six feet tall and weighing 140 pounds, he used to joke that he'd be invisible if he turned sideways. Opposing hitters said he kicked his foot up so high during his pitching motion that he'd block out the sun. Teammates reported that he'd warm up by throwing strikes over a gum wrapper. Fans said he'd sometimes tell the Monarchs' defense to sit on the ground and watch while he struck out formidable batters. Though the tall tales about Page may inspire skepticism for modern-day fans, his impact on the game was indisputable. His per-game strikeout record was 22, pitched against major league barnstormers, which would be an all-time record. Around this time, Robinson also broke onto the scene. The UCLA football star hit almost 400 as the Monarch shortstop before making his jump to the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1947, becoming the first black player in Major League Baseball. As Major League Baseball desegregated in the late 40s and early 50s, the Monarchs played a key role, developing more major leaguers than any other Negro League team, including Page, Robinson, and other stars like Ernie Banks and Elston Howard. But as you'd expect, the pipeline also caused the Monarchs and the Negro Leagues as a whole to lose most of their top talent. The Monarchs would go on to win one last pennant in 1946, but would lose a seven-game World Series to the Newark Eagles. In the years leading up to the 1955 season, problems had been developing in Philadelphia. The owners of the Philadelphia Athletics were going bankrupt and needed a new buyer to relieve them of their financial burden, which they found in Arnold Johnson, the owner of the Monarchs' long-used Blues Stadium in Kansas City. The two teams had to share the stadium, but the Monarchs ended up with the short end of the stick. The Athletics were given the more favorable dates for playing, and the Monarchs were charged more rent for occupying the space than before. These problems led to the team being sold to Ted Raspberry, who chose to move the Monarchs to his hometown of Grand Rapids, Michigan to begin their 1956 season at Grand Valley Field. Despite the move, the Monarchs kept Kansas City in their name. They gradually became more of a barnstorming team, yet still playing in the Negro American League. As integration in Major League Baseball increased during the late 1950s and more African American players were signed to Major League teams, the Negro American League came to an end after its 1962 season. But this did not stop the Monarchs. They continued to be a barnstorming team until after their 1965 season, when their 45 years as one of the best teams in the Negro Leagues officially came to an end. Today, Grand Valley Field still stands under the name of Sullivan Field, allowing for future generations of ballplayers to enjoy the space once occupied by this great team.